So uh, I'm Hani Junid from Baylor College of Medicine and the Michael E. D. Bakey VA Medical Center. It's truly a pleasure to be here to talk to you about <laughs> MI complications. This is really bread and butter uh, clinical cardiology. Um, so let me start by telling you that there are four types of complications post-MI. How can I move the... Uh... Oh, here it is. Oh, from here? Okay. So there are four types of uh, complications uh, post-MI. There are hemodynamic disturbances, uh, of which there are four types, LV failure, with or without RV failure, cardiogenic shock, predominant RV failure, and mechanical complications. There are electrical complications, there are pericardial complications, and other miscellaneous complications, such as LV aneurysm, pulmonary embolism, and LV thrombus with arterial embolism. So uh, because of the sake of time, I may not be able to touch uh, 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 and discuss all those four complications, but at least I will focus on the one and the ones that are most important, such as hemodynamic disturbances, and as well as electrical uh, uh, arrhythmias. So let's start with the least common, which are the mechanical complications of, of acute MI. These are the least common, but these are the most dreadful because they are associated with the in highest uh, in-hospital and intermediate term mortality. So the three major types of mechanical complications are LV free wall rupture, septal wall rupture, and the development of mitral regurgitation. And the mainstay treatment is percutaneous circulatory assist device, followed by emergent surgical repair, repair with or without cabbage. So uh, the frequency is really less than 1%. This is from the apex ST elevation MI trial from a decade ago, in which the uh, occurrence was 0.91%. But notice the Kaplan-Meier curves in the right lower corner. Uh, uh, survival at 90 days was 40%. Uh, this is maybe a decade old right now, but, uh, and I suspect survival has improved a bit with the use of percutaneous circulatory assist devices, but still uh, uh, it's in the range of 50% or so. Starting with the first uh, complication, it's the LV free wall rupture. This is associated with the highest uh, mortality. Risk factors, no prior angina or MI, transmural MI, large MIs, and usually pharmaceutical therapy use are all associated with free wall rupture. And usually it occurs within 50%. In 50% of the time, it occurs within the first five days. But uh, in more than uh, uh, almost all of them occur within the first two weeks. So it has a bimodal uh, or biphasic uh, uh, onset uh, with early phase and the late phase. And usually it affects commonly the anterior and the lateral walls, usually near the junction of the infected and uh, normal myocardium. So the clinical presentation can be one of three, sudden death, hemopericardium with tamponade leading to death, and incomplete or subacute rupture, and this is the 30-40% uh, time where you can probably salvage these patients. Management, immediate echocardiogram, and if there's hemopericardium, you wanna do controlled pericardiocentesis and send for immediate surgery uh, along with hemodynamic stabilization with vasopressors. Uh, and most importantly, prompt surgical repair. Now, number two is ventricular septal wall rupture. This is uh, 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 less than half in frequency uh, uh, compared to a free wall rupture. Almost the same timing by, mode, by phasic mode. Uh, it usually occurs within three to five days, but can occur up to two weeks. And the risk factors are very similar. There's increased risk, particularly with the one vessel, single vessel, coronary artery disease, particularly with a wrap around LED. And this is the instance whereby you see an apical uh, ventricular septal wall uh, defect. Uh, the rupture site, it occurs equally in, uh, in equal frequency in anterior and non-anterior infarction. And uh, if you have an anterior MI, it usually occurs at the apical, at the apex. With inferior MI, it's usually at the base. And again, it occurs at the margin of the necrotic and non-necrotic myocardium. And clinically, you see a patient in shock, hypotensive, biventricular failure, usually predominantly right-sided uh, failure, and uh, new murmur that's usually harsh, loud, holosystolic with a palpable thrill, RV lift, and hyperdynamic uh, precordium. Uh, 
So you diagnose it uh, typically with an echocardiogram, uh, although a right heart cath would show giant V waves, non-specific but very helpful. And the management is really surgical repair. Uh, now, the timing is controversial with some studies showing that maybe earlier uh, surgery may be associated with increased operative mortality, but this is likely related to uh, selection bias. Nowadays, with the emergence of the percutaneous circulatory assist devices, we use either um, an impella or a tandem heart or even a percutaneous ECMO to stabilize these patients. And there's evidence if you passivate these patients with circulatory assist devices, and wait for a few days, you allow for myocardial healing, not a few days, maybe a couple of weeks, and then you proceed for surgical repair. Um, this is a case uh, of a patient we've seen like three or four years ago coming in with completed transmural infarct in the ostium of his LED. Uh, it was a large LED that traps around, so this resulted in an apical uh, VSD. He was in shock. And this is the left atrial tracing, and you could see this gigantic V wave. Uh, approaching 35 millimeter uh, of mercury in uh, severity. Uh, and then we inserted a tandem heart, and this is not playing over here. So it's not playing. Um, so anyway, this uh, gentleman uh, ended up having a tandem heart to unload the heart from the left atrium and uh, uh, followed by uh, Amplatzer device to close his ventricular septal defect. He did very well in the intermediate term, but then uh, died uh, uh, three, four months afterwards. Uh, now, acute mitral rigors is the second, is the third uh, uh, mechanical complication of acute MI. Really, uh, MR, um, of moderate or, sev or, or severe degree can occur in up to 3% of all uh, acute MI patients. Uh, and it's predominantly related to LV dilatation. But uh, whenever it's related to ischemic papillary muscle displacement or papillary muscle rupture, this is when it's really a mechanical complication. And in the shock trial, almost 40% of patients had moderate or severe MR. The uh, murmur uh, does not necessarily correlate with the intensity of uh, the murmur test does not necessarily correlate with the intensity or, or the severity of the, of the mitral rigors because if you have uh, uh, equalization between the LVDP and the left atrial pressure uh, in 50% of the time, you may not hear even a murmur. Uh, papillary muscle rupture, uh, rupture could be partial or complete. And remember, the posterior medial papillary muscle is the one that's most prone to rupture because of single uh, uh, blood supply. So clinical manifestation, very similar to VSD. Acute VSD, it's cardiogenic shock with acute hypotension, pulmonary edema, hyperactive uh, precordium, and then you have a holosystolic murmur, but in 50% of the time you may not hear it. It may be very soft because of pressure equalization, and you see a giant V wave uh, similar to what you've seen with the VSD. Note this is nonspecific. It could happen also with severe heart failure and VSD and other uh, clinical conditions. And uh, very important clinically, when you have an acute MI, you want to listen to the patients and make sure that there is no new murmur that you've detected. And an echocardiogram uh, at the bedside in the ER or even in the cardiac cath lab is extremely important. Oftentimes, you would want to resort to a transit vagal echocardiogram to visualize uh, uh, the uh, mitral valve uh, and the prolapsing uh, apparatus of the mitral valve, which uh, may not be visualized in 30 or 40 percent of the time by a transthoracic echocardiogram. Uh, and then you go with a cardiac cath uh, to visualize the coronary anatomy, followed by uh, emergent uh, surgery. Uh, again, uh, support with percutaneous circulatory assist device is mainstay. You can use one of any devices, impella, tandem heart, or uh, percutaneous ECMO, and uh, followed by emergency uh, surgical intervention with cabbage, uh, if uh, possible. Uh, so, going from the mechanical complications, let us go to the LV failure, which is really the most common uh, uh, hemodynamic disturbance. Uh, Post-MI, remember LV function is the single most important predictor of mortality after an acute MI. And with an acute MI, you have both systolic and diastolic dysfunction, which leads respectively to uh, depressed cardiac output and hypotension and to pulmonary venous uh, uh, hypertension and congestional pulmonary edema. 
Now, uh, whenever you have acute heart failure complicating acute MI, positive anotropic agents are not the first line agents. They're only reserved for uh, very refractory uh, uh, LV dysfunction uh, uh, with ensuring shock. But if you have a good blood pressure, you would want to unload the heart. And uh, you do this by reducing the preload and afterload of the heart, as well as you want to avoid arrhythmias. So besides mechanical intubation and oxygenation and diuresis, you'd want to unload the heart while avoiding excessive hypotension and excessive reduction in the LV filling pressure. So you'd want to maintain systolic blood pressure of uh, 90 or so to maintain coronary perfusion. You wouldn't want to diurese below 18 millimeter of mercury, and ideally best to use the combination of nitroprusside and nitroglycerin to unload the heart. Uh, followed by oral agents such as ACE inhibitor and or the combination of nitrates and or hydralazine. However, if you're hypotensive, shocky, there's no room in blood pressure and you have or, uh, and organ damage or hyperperfusion systematically, then you would need to resort to inotropic uh, agent and to vasopressors. And um, dopamine, uh, usually I use it in a very low dose below 5 mic uh, to achieve renal and splanking vasodilation and uh, oftentimes whenever needed you run a real inotrope because dopamine is predominantly a vasopressor so you add dobutamine to it. Uh, it has better inotropic action, less chronotropic effect, less tachyarrhythmia, although it can cause hypotension and oftentimes you're going to use it with dopamine. Milinone is a second inotropic agent that you could add. Uh, it could cause hypotension and tachyarrhythmia and it's an excellent pulmonary venous or pulmonary arterial vasodilator. Now, the third hemodynamic disturbance I want to talk about is cardiogenic shock. And in 80% of acute MI patients, it's related to extensive LV myocardial damage, but 20% it's related to predominant RV infarct or to a mechanical complication. For ST elevation MI, it's in the range of 6 to 8%. For uh, non-ST elevation MI, which still can occur with non-ST elevation ACS, it's maybe 2 to 3%. And it's usually, besides uh, pulmonary edema and hypotension, uh, and reduction in cardiac index, you have organ hypoperfusion. So you have uh, low renal output, cloud sensorium, oliguria, and systemic acidemia. Um, and again, you've got besides systolic and diastolic dysfunction, leading to low cardiac output and to pulmonary edema, you have uh, with refractory cardiogenic shock. And again, cardiogenic shock is it's very tough to classify. We're actually right now uh, writing the guidelines for the cardiogenic shock. Uh, and for classification, there are older classifications classifying them into pre-shock, shock, and refractory cardiogenic shock, uh, although the, the, the differentiation between these is extremely uh, subtle. But with end-stage cardiogenic shock, you have also uh, 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 inducible nitric ox uh, oxide synthesis that uh, uh, secretes a lot of nitric oxide, and you have systemic vasodilation. Um, and that uh, is really uh, the end stage of cardiogenic shock. Early revascularization is the mainstay treatment. This is now historic from 99. This is the shock trial showing 13% absolute risk reduction in mortality at six months. Benefit was shown in all subgroups. The elderly subgroup was underpowered. This is a meta-analysis one of our fellows did three, four years ago, showing even in the elderly patient above 70 year of age in selective, well-selected patients, there's benefits even uh, in uh, the elderly patients with early revascularization compared to initial medical therapy. And oh, luckily this is playing. So this is a case one of our fellows called me three weeks literally uh, on a Saturday and You've seen the coronary anatomy. This is an elderly patient with shock, and now it's not playing. And uh, critical uh, LED, multi-lesion left circumflex artery, and multi multiple lesions in the right coronary artery. EF was 10, 15%. Uh, he was hypotensive, uh, uh, and he, wa he was intubated when I saw him. You saw that we had an impella placed. And following the impella, this is the end result after four or five stenting in the LED, as well as two stents in the left circ. And with the impella, this is the RCA with the three stents. So after six hours and nine stents, the patient uh, uh, did very well, actually. Now, what I want to show you is this. This is his blood pressure 
uh, in the middle of the case. This, that was a six or seven hour case and either eight or nine stents. But look at the loss of pulsatility in this patient. So the, and this is, I believe, at the end of the case, by which time we revascularize most of his coronary arteries. There were times during the case where he was almost flat, at which time the impeller took over completely. So very briefly, I want to talk about percutaneous circulatory assist devices. And we are hoping in six months to come up with the guidelines on the cardiogenic shock. So please stay tuned for this. Four types of circulatory assist devices. I keep calling them percutaneous ventricular assist devices, but with the uh, presence of percutaneous ECMO, it's no longer a ventricular assist device. Balloon pump uh, used to be uh, uh, very commonly used in cardiogenic shock. The shock two trial at 30 days showed no impact on mortality in ST elevation MI patients. Revascularized with a primary PCI. It's eight French, easy to insert. We still use it in very mild shock in patients with refractory ischemia and unstable non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome and with very high risk PCI. Now, uh, this is the shock two trial that I talked about. The impella is the new uh, kid in the block. I mean, not new, maybe uh, uh, six, seven years, but uh, just this year it got approval, FDA approval for cardiogenic shock. And uh, over the past two years, we have the Impella cardiac power, which delivers up to 3.5 liter per minute, so allow a very good unloading of the left ventricle compared to the prior Impella percutaneous prior Impella, which was 2.5 liter per minute. It basically unloads the heart from the left ventricle to the aorta. Uh, some people say it may have an advantage in increasing coronary perfusion. Of course, contraindicated in severe AI and with LV thrombus, so always get an echocardiogram beforehand. And tandem heart is really dying off. We had one of the largest series, not only in the VA healthcare system, but also in the, uh, in the country uh, three, four years ago. But this is dying off because of the emergence of uh, Impella. Uh, some people argue this is a better unloading of the heart because you're unloading the heart from the left atrium more upstream rather than unloading it from the left ventricle as is done by an Impella. Uh, however, it entails a transeptal puncture and it's usually 15 or 17 arterial cannula compared to a 13.5 arterial cannula with uh, the impeller. I do not think I have much time to talk about the pericardial and electrical complications, uh, but you have these uh, for, uh, for your uh, pleasure and reading in your handouts. Thank you for your time. Pleasure being here with you.